Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined by Shane Kennedy from Source America today. Um, I'm on the road, so I'm, uh, I'm actually on holiday. So I'm just here to say hi and, and fleeting goodbye uh, because actually I want to stay married. So uh, I need to go and join my wife on holiday. So <laughs> hi, hi, Shane, and bye, Shane, and, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us, and I appreciate you letting me go. <laughs> Yes, and have a fun vacation and go be obedient to your wife, like all Thank you. good husbands. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. So, Shane, if, if, will you mind, tell the audience more about who you are, what you do, and also today we're going to talk about a lot of the work you've been doing um, with Future of the Work, Future of Work. Okay. Yeah, happy to. So thank you so much for having me. This is a great honor to join you today. Uh, been very much looking forward to this. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, I work at Source America. Um, we are an independent 501c3 nonprofit organization, um, domestic in the United States. And our mission is to um, work with a network of nonprofit organizations all across the country who provide um, various levels of supports and services um, to um, facilitate the employment of persons with disabilities um, through a variety of channels. And we are a unique entity in that because we're a central nonprofit agency under a federal program here in the United States. Um, so sort of an interesting, um, unique configuration. Um, but we've been doing that for um, around 45 years or so. Um, within the organization, we do a lot of different things um, outside of um, purely facilitating some of the employment outcomes of the program. Um, for example, I'm in our government affairs and public policy office currently, um, soon to be heading up our workforce development division, which is a new uh, change for me. Um, but within government affairs and public policy, we do a tremendous amount of advocacy on Capitol Hill, working with our Senate and House um, offices to help advise them on policies for the inclusion of persons with disabilities um, through employment. And um, for the past two and a half years, I've focused on that primarily. and also joining in the research on future of work as a, an issue area for me. Um, and then I get to also um, have the great fortune of working with some of our domestic and international representation and partnerships, um, which is a very fulfilling thing I get to do, a lot of fun, um, very enriching in my, my life experience, but also really makes me feel like I'm contributing to a larger conversation. Thank you, Sean, Shane. Uh, in, in the area of uh, future of work, have you done any studies uh, recently? Uh, yes. So um, over the past year, so back from May of 2018, um, we've released a number of papers on the topic of the future of work. Um, starting in May, actually, our initial baseline study called the, the future of work in the disability community, um, really looking holistically within the United States as a focal point, um, because that's where we operate. Um, and then several other papers that we released um, that were kind of signaling some of the social innovation work we were doing in that space and also how we were acting as a convener with other stakeholder groups to um, have a very robust conversation with many different viewpoints on the topic. Um, so I think we released um, six original papers um, in 2018 and two additional papers that we worked with uh, an outside firm to help with some independent perspective. So, uh, so when, when you talk with organizations about inclusion and work for people with disabilities, uh, is there um, areas where you find the conversation that needs to be more explained uh, or organizations more or less, they, they understand how can they do that by themselves? Uh, it's interesting. A lot of the conversations start from a very well-intended question. Um, what kind of work can people with disabilities do? Right. So you understand the context of the question that's being asked, but it's it's really um, kind of a misnomer in the thought process. Right. Um, starting from that premise, it, it's really about identifying the unique talents and attributes that anybody has that fulfills a need for an organization, um, a business need, and a, a very fulfilling, meaningful. Um, uh, application of work. Um, so I think in a lot of cases, it's even starting from that context of understanding the community in which they would like to engage and um, then taking it from there to really have a more expansive conversation about the, the broad diversity of the community 
fulfilling any number of potential roles for any company um, based on the talent that, that is inherently there. So Shane, I know in the United States, um, a lot of people um, assume that Source America, and I might be incorrect, maybe I'm the one that's assuming this, but that a lot of the work that y'all do is supporting people with intellectual disabilities, people that are neurodiverse uh, on the spectrum and things like that. And um, I don't think that's really true. I think that you, that Source America works with the community of people with disabilities, but I, I was just wondering if you would elaborate on that. And also, when we talk about future of work, a lot of people are talking about future of work, mm -hmm. but the reality is it's, it means different things to different people depending on how they're talking about it. And so I was wondering if you would also elaborate on what what, what is this, when you say future of work, what does that mean to sure. you as the author, but also to Source America? What do you mean by using that term? I, because I, everybody has a different definition in their head. Absolutely, no, I, that's a great question. Um, so I'll, I'll answer here first. Um, so Source America, um, through our network of nonprofit organizations, serve the broad diversity of the disability community. Um, so about half um, the individuals that are served through the programs are people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, but also serve um, people with impacts of mental health, um, people um, that have um, potential uh, other impacts of disabilities, um, ambulatory disabilities, those sorts of things, um, but also serving veterans, um, disabled veterans, wounded warriors um, as well. Um, so really it's, it's a, really cuts across kind of the, the diversity of the community, um, but uh, about half the people that we serve are people with IDD. Um, and when we when we talk about the future of work, so our definition of the future of work, and, and it's um, it's an interesting space to be in um, because we have gravitated away from a preoccupation with uh, robots and artificial intelligence as like the main construct of this topic. Um, but for us, it really is it's the convergence of um, societal, legislative, economic, and technological factors that are impacting how, when, and where people will work. And um, from our perspective, what is that direct um, implication for persons with disabilities in the United States? Um, the unique considerations that might come along with um, different societal um, constructs for what that means around inclusion, um, around the different policies that might be in place or emerging um, that really represent um, a movement towards um, greater expectations of inclusion. What does that mean? And then how does technology, how is that an enabler or potentially an inhibitor of those things, depending on how you um, enter into that conversation and really maximize those opportunities. Um, so when we talk about the future of work, we really see it as the, convergent of the, the convergence of those factors. And then we really pursue that topic through research, through advocacy, and through social innovation projects. And one thing that I, I am seeing in uh, in the United States, but I'm also seeing it in other countries that I'm very concerned about, is that the there are so many corporations trying to include people with disabilities, and I applaud all of the efforts. And they're sometimes getting very mixed messages from the disability persons organizations, business to business organizations that are supposed to support them. They're, well, you're not any good if you don't spend money with me here and if you don't do this. And it's mm -hmm. uh, most of the conver a lot of the conversations I see happening in the United States are being led by money. And mm -hmm. that um, that's a little bit of who we are. But at the same time, it's troubling to me because I see people with uh, more profound disabilities or multiple disabilities or maybe what we would call I don't like the word severe disabilities, but um, they're being left out, con sure. continuing to be left out. In the United States, we have not done as good of a job with employing people with disabilities as other countries. For example, UK is doing a much better job of employing individuals with disabilities in the United States. Is. And it's not really about, ooh, you're better than, it's not even all that. I just wish that in the United States, we would took a, take a little bit more of a look at the successes that we're having in other parts of the country, which is one reason why, I mean, other parts of the world, mm -hmm. um, which is one reason why I enjoy your work. But um, I, I am very troubled that um, we think that uh, because of the broadness of the de definition of um, disabilities and our Americans with Disabilities Act, it is very broad on purpose. Um, 
you know, the yes, uh, Antonio just put in the chat window, the Washington Supreme Court rules that obesity is a disability. And um, there are a lot of Americans that are obese. So if you start looking at all the definitions that we include in disabilities, um, sometimes corporations can forget about the community that we were actually trying to make sure were included in the workforce, people with more severe disabilities, some of my talented employees, for example. And um, so I was just wondering how your reports, how the work that you're doing at Source America is trying to uh, deal with some of these issues that are happening in the United States to cause us not to be as effective um, at employing people with uh, more profound disabilities. Sure. I think one thing that you said that really hits the nail on the head is there's this there's this um, uh, situation in which sometimes we're our own worst enemies and trying to make the progress that we all expect, right? Um, so there's only so much social and political capital to go around. And when we, um, within the community, when I'm talking about we, I'm talking about within the disability community, when different groups with um, varying perspectives go to the same audiences with a variation on the same ask, it perpetuates confusion and it leads to continued inaction. And you can't really fault the audience in that case because they are receiving different messages and you're almost putting them in a position where if I don't, if I don't select to work with you, am I offending a different group? Am I putting myself in an a implication of risk, especially legislators? Right. That that's a that's a huge potential of area of, of risk for them. Um, so one of the things that we've really focused on doing through our future of work programs, as an example, is trying to convene diverse perspectives, bring uh, kind of divergent thought together and different stakeholder groups that might hold varying philosophical positions on different topics who might not ordinarily work together in their their normal day to day operations but coming together under a unifying objective of we all recognize that the world the world of work is going to change in the future. We all recognize that we have shared responsibility and fulfilling a promise of a, a more inclusive future. So how do we work in the same direction on that rather than acting as if it's a zero sum game and only some of us can succeed while others cannot? So, uh... I often follow a lot of uh, events related with human resources, future of work, and there are you know, a large, no, a good number of events in the United States focus on that area, like SHRM, you know, where everyone, all HR professionals, they all join and talk about industry best practices. And there's been a lot of conversations on diversity, but they are usually more focused on gender, mm -hmm. on ethnicity, and around that, those areas. There's not really uh, a, a kind of a, a a panel to discuss disability. Do you think that the reason why that happens is because some of the points that you have highlighted? And how do you make this connection between employment for people with disabilities and, and actually having this conversation at the large events that folk where HR professionals are, are often present? Sure. No, that's a great point. Um, and I think some of it might be what we were just talking about, right? Some of the, the messaging that they receive that might lead them in varying different directions at the same time, which creates confusion and inaction. But some of it is just the inherent social identity of persons with disabilities and how society assigns value to different demographic groups when they're talking about diversity and the outward representation and political or social power of those groups to affect change. And, uh, I go to many future of work related um, uh, events. And for the past two and a half years, I have found myself being the only person from a disability based organization at those events. And asking the questions in a public forum um, of the, the panelists, well, what about the inclusion of persons with disabilities? When you talk about all of these um, different trends and you talk about automation and you talk about the economy and talk about um, what might happen as um, it creates potentially greater divergence in um, the haves and have nots in the future, right? Where do persons with disabilities enter into that conversation into your thought process? And when you po pose that question publicly, there is power in asking that question in front of 200 people that weren't even thinking about that in the first place. And so I think part of it is unapologetically claiming a seat at the table for those conversations, getting outside of who we normally talk to within the community, 
uh, we go to uh, disability community events, right, where we kind of commiserate on the same topics, but we don't go to these other events where we really try to broaden the conversation and the perspective of those groups that are speculating or creating recommendations for how the future might work. And if you're not at the table for those conversations, uh, by and large, you shouldn't expect to receive the benefits of what might happen as a result of their intervention. Um, so I think it's really, it's, it's, it's being present in those things and it's pursuing those conversations. And because there's a compelling argument to be made that action is needed right now to include persons with disabilities in this conversation, otherwise policy recommendations and different programmatic interventions that groups might come up with are going to serve to fur further marginalize people within society and economically. Right, so it has to happen now and we have to continue to be engaged. Deborah, uh, you have engaged, uh, no, we have engaged with, with uh, Valuable 500 and Deborah, you have also have this type of conversations with uh, many, uh, many organizations who, who are signing the Valuable 500 uh, pledge from Caroline Car Casey. How do you see this conversation involved from your side? Well, it's I, I'm I'm actually um, getting a little discouraged about what I'm seeing um, in the United States with the Valuable 500. Uh, to me, it, the Valuable 500 is such an easy yes because there's no cost. There's you're not going to have to sign anything that puts puts your corporation at risk. And I've recently started seeing the diversity and inclusion part of the organization. It's like the accessibility part, if you have one. They want to do it, but the diversity and inclusion people don't want to do it. And I think uh, that is confusing to me why there's two sides at all. And then I, ha I see uh, U.S. corporations saying, well, you know, we're, we'll just wait and see what everybody else does. And I get that, especially in a place where we're so, we litigate. And, but at the same time, I am, the, 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 the Americans with Disabilities Act is 29 years old. And um, we have been waiting to be included. And, and I love corporations. I, I love brands. And I get to talk to all these amazing brands. But... I'm getting to the point where I'm getting very disappointed with the disability groups that are not serving our community. I'm getting disappointed with the disability groups that are only following the money. One big corporation gives this disability group all this money and it's pretty much that's it. That, that corporation owns the conversation. Nobody else can join. I know one um, large corporation gave a bunch of money to a group in the United States and I talked to some of the other corporations and they're like, well, we only gave 15,000 so we understand we're not gonna be at the table. And I think that is really a problem in the United mm -hmm. States, not just the United States, it's happening all over the world, but it seems like some of the disability leaders and groups have forgotten who the community is they're supposed to be supporting. The community is the community of people with disabilities. And yes, we're struggling as a community to have a voice and to have a strong voice. I think we can learn a lot from the efforts that LGBTQ you know, uh, have done and, and how they pulled together to really fight as a community. I think we still have the opportunity there. And I think the work that we've done, Antonio, with Access Chat and with other shows are helping break down some of these barriers. I also see the young people with disabilities in the United States. They seem to be coming to me more and more, maybe because they see I'm open, saying, we're really tired of your generation, Deborah, not wanting to retire, and you will never give us the microphone. You all are hmm. never going to retire. Our voices are never going to matter. And it's, you know, we see older white people, mainly males, still holding all the conversations. When is it our turn? So it's, there's this convergent, convergence happening, which I think is very important. And I think some of us, including me, have to be brave enough to say, I'm going to call BS on what I'm seeing, and I'm about to write an article that I'm going to turn into Forbes about this conversation. I'm not going to be ugly. I'm not naming names. I think a lot of people know all these groups that are with us or are not with us, but I think it's time for capital. You know, it's all being all about money. Well, I'm, it, we can't do that anymore because it's what, Shane, you were saying. This is going to continue to leave us behind. Now, you mentioned SHRM. SHRM has brought me in to talk about disability inclusion multiple times and other leaders. So they're trying, but 
somehow we have also now gotten in camps in that, well, I'm all about DNI. Oh, well, I'm all about accessibility. Well, I'm not going to listen to either one of you. I'm going to talk about inclusive design. Well, I'm not. So it's like all these camps are confusing the corporations and the brands and the people that are trying to make a difference. And I think somebody's going to have to be brave enough. And I'm going to pull, especially everything I'm walking with my daughter with Down syndrome being so sick right now. Um, I'm just not going to put up with, and my husband acquiring a horrible disability, dis, you know, dementia. This is real to me. And if you are a disability leader and you're not doing the right thing by our community, which means you're really, you're not listening to the corporations that are just giving you money just so you'll hush, but you're going to do the right thing by our community, then I think we're going to have to get a lot more vocal about this. So, um, I, I, uh, uh, let, yeah. let me just t throw a little bit some uh, uh, to, to the mix. Now, uh, uh, I think uh, um, uh, uh, Accenture they released a, a report on uh, in on inclusion, and they actually create a case for the employment of people with disabilities. They created an index, so you know, they are well, very well known in the in the industry. They they, they have a, they are a company with a very interesting impact in digital transformation. So. If they were able to create that case, if they have people from their side who understand that well, unlike other people in other organizations like IBM, our own, or even at Siemens, you know, why do you see that other organizations are not able to follow that, you know, are not able to see that as a, a, a reference for them? James, yeah. do you want to... Sure, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to. So um, I think, Antonio, what you're talking about really gets to the heart of some of the exploration that we've done is the core narrative of the breakdown and the, the larger systems and constructs of, an, uh, of employment of persons with disabilities in the United States to us always comes back to the social identity question, right? We can, we can try to affect the behavior of people within the system and we can spend a lot of our time and energy talking about employment, talking about education, talking about policymaking in silos in different ways. But if you're not affecting inherently the the way that society assigns value to people and the investment that they're willing to make, then you're not going to see true behavior change, right? So, so the work that Accenture has done is, is appealing to the business sense of private sector, right? That's important because that's, it's a part of the conversation and you're meeting people where they are in that conversation. But the underpinning of all of these things should be a, an unapologetic confronting of the, the social identity-based barriers that are really impacting this conversation. That's such a good point, Shane. And you know what I'm seeing also happening? And I know you know this too. So I, I assume Source America is a nonprofit. Is that mm -hmm. a correct assumption? Okay. Correct. And I'm seeing that there are some self-appointed disability groups that have decided that the nonprofits and the disability persons organizations, they don't understand the complexity of business. They don't understand brands. And so they don't really belong in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I've actually, I've known brands that have reached out to some of these business to business groups that are supposed to be supporting corporations, including people with disabilities. And, you know, they're applauding, you know, corporations that um, have hired five people with disabilities over five years that have, you know, five, 500,000 employees. I'm exaggerating, but not that much. And um, because those corporations have given them so much money. But I see the disability persons organizations being left out of the conversations and uninvited to the conversations. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time recently on my show, Human Potential at Work, interviewing leaders, uh, Dr. Kirk Adams of the um, American Foundation for the Blind. And uh, we've talked about deaf and things like that and the deaf community and how valuable they are. But I, you're right. As long as we keep deciding as society that people with disabilities are broken, if they don't, if they speak a different language that because they speak sign language or they cannot see in the traditional manner or whatever our reasons, we are going to continue to fail. And it's, we are, we're a developed country. We've spent, we're spending so much money on disability inclusion, but our numbers, even though they're rising slowly, still we are not seeing people with disabilities, especially more profound disabilities as adding value to our workforce yeah. because we are not including them. 
And, and, and even as you look at the, the economic indicators of progress, right? If, you, if, if we get hung up looking at the same numbers that, that kind of everyone, it permeates like the news cycle, right? The unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is a false indicator of progress. It, it really takes, it, it, it ignores the fact that there are millions and millions of people not even connected to the labor force in the first place. And so when we when we focus on the unemployment rate and, unimpre- and unprecedented levels of economic kind of um, uh, the status that we're in currently in the United States, right, with the low levels of unemployment, it really ignores the true underpinning of the problem that we are talking about, right? Um, the, the populations and not just persons with disabilities, so many other populations that are completely left out of the labor market. Right, and, and generally uh, the populations of people that um, have darker skins than mine, for example. Mm-hmm. If you can see me, I have a very light, uh, fair Caucasian complexion. And, you know, so, Antonio? No, in fact, the, 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 what you just brought you know, is, is you know, considering the uh, uh, United States, it's, it's sometimes I have to feel that when, when you look at tech companies, it's a bit disappointing uh, how white male they are. You know, it's, uh, it's, I feel, you know, that type of a disappointment, but I'll, you know, we are in, in 2019 and some organizations have about, you know, 2%, 3%. It's, uh, it's you know, I, I don't even know how to express myself here, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it becomes when, when, when you try to act on those, those issues, right, by setting quotas and setting targets for the inclusion of various populations, right, then you're also wading into the territory of regulatory oversight and risk and fear and those sorts of things um, if you're not compliant. And, and you know, it's a, it's a carrot and stick approach, and we, we try both of those things in the United States. Um, and so far, if you look at data over the course of time, it has not been uh, incredibly impactful in the overall conversation of what we're talking about. So I think a lot of it still gets back to you know, you can put regulatory oversight to try and compel people to do something, but if you're not affecting how they assign value to people in the first place, they're not going to act in the way that you would expect or hope. I agree. I agree. And that's what we're seeing, too. And, and it's just um, sometimes it, what I found, and Antonio and Neil really helped me see this, but I found, I find, and I know, Shane, that you've seen this as well, but the more interesting conversations are happening outside these disability silos. And Mm -hmm. the conversations that I'm getting to have on the people-centered internet and cyber safety to make sure all children are safe, including children that um, have disabilities, including children that are LGBT or transgender. Um, I know LT goes for that, but but the our vulnerable part of our populations that, as you said, constantly are being left out. And so I, I think that there is actually quite a bit of very, very powerful things happening that some of the status quo, they don't even realize these things are happening. They don't even see it. They don't see the conversations we're having with the robotics and the AI and Shane, the leadership you're showing at Source America with the future of work conversations. And, but I am putting these leaders on notice that things are changing and Mm -hmm. we're not going to put up with this anymore. And we've got to make sure that I was recently invited to speak in New York City at a really fabulous event. And it was going to be a big deal and I would be all that. And I told them, no, I don't want to speak. I want you instead to put on stage LaMondre Pugh, who is a amazing man with profound disabilities and he's a man of color and he's a brilliant voice and mm-hmm. put K.R. Lou up there who is with Amazon who has she was born with um, you know severe hearing loss and she uses hearing aids and she's brilliant and wonderful and vivacious and she's a younging to me because she's 41 years old but I mean she's just fabulous and then I recommended other younger leaders that are not being put on the stage leaders with open, obvious disabilities that can really talk about who are they. Uh, Mm -hmm. I have a lot of hope for the young people, but I think what the older people among us, I'm older than all of you guys, but, you know, 
you, we have to make sure that we are opening the door wide for the others. I, I mentioned a couple of times there was a trend on Twitter, tw and it was trending um, white privilege. And I thought, oh, don't go in there, Deborah. It's going to be so scary. But I thought, no, I'm going in. So I went in, and they said, what are you doing with your white privilege? And I said, I'm opening the door wide behind me so the young people with diversity can come in everybody because human beings are diverse what's that's what makes us so amazing as human beings and so i think leaders need to look at yourself and you need to ask yourself some really important questions are you doing th the right thing by the community or are you just only doing what you're told by money and, and i'll give you one more thing then i'll i'm gonna stop we were really blessed at my company. We were told about a, a bill, AB 1395, that was happening in California, and it was about privacy, but we were afraid there could be implications to the community of people with disabilities because these voice devices, we use them more than the rest of the population. So if you take these voice devices away from us, you're going to hurt our community. And they had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in trying to lobby and make this happen. Well, my team got involved in three days before the bill was to be passed. And we talked to the legislators and we went all over social media and a lot of our partners that are part of the Access Chat community helped and they pulled the bill. And they said, we don't want this to hurt people with disabilities. So these gigantic corporations couldn't stop this because they were making it all about themselves. But when we ask, please, you know, Assemblyman, you know, Cunningham, please just make sure this isn't going to hit, hurt our community, immediately they stopped it. And, yeah. and even we were shocked. We were shocked that they would listen. We're not used to politicians listening to our community. And so there is a sea change happening and a lot of these community leaders that are not taking care of our community they're, they're going to be left because they should be left and i yeah. think these conversations we're having where we are really wanting to change society so that people with disabilities and underserved populations can truly be included this is truly the future of work so let me hush and give you and antonio time to talk sorry no, I was going to share some um, recent um, success that we've been having on the policy front as well. And what we have found is when when you when you come to these meetings and you take maybe a bill that's already been introduced or um, something that was introduced in the prior Congress that they're thinking about reintroducing, and you you show to them very you know very directly the the language that you've used in this is unintentionally uh, exclusionary. Right. You, you have a generalized notion of what the population is when you talk about the future of employment. Uh, there's a picture in your head by default of what what does an employee look like. And when you do not give um, consideration to the broad diversity of the labor force in that, you might be unintentionally negatively impacting and creating greater divides and greater um, kind of divergence in society and, and the economy. And so we took um, several um, future of work related bills and just did redline edits where the language could be expansive, could be more inclusive in the concept of the population um, to include traditionally underrepresented populations, uh, specifically persons with disabilities or you know, however that would be identified. But the fact that you're affecting language in such a way that you're making it more inclusive it is a step in the right direction, right? Um, but one of the things that I try to be very sensitive about, and I think what you were really talking about, um, Deborah, with young leaders in the disability community um, having that opportunity, and I've had the opportunity to work with uh, many very exciting young leaders in that area. Um, but you know, even within my role, you know, I try to be very sensitive to the fact that I do not personally identify as a person with a disability. I I have extensive family history with that topic. And so it's very close to me, and uh, I've been in a, a different sort of kind of um, uh, impacted role when it comes to that conversation. But I also do not pr present myself or represent myself as speaking on behalf of the community or speaking on behalf of persons with disabilities. I'm asking questions and I'm trying to um, do what I can to open doors and be a convener um, because that's the role that I've fortunately been placed in doing. But it's about opening the doors so that persons with disabilities and those affected by what we're talking about have the floor to then take it and run with it right and to, to really um, talk about what they are what they desire for the future 
and we need allies. I, I'm not part of the LGBT community, but I refuse to let those people continue to suffer and be and you know be attacked, especially the members of LGBT community that have disabilities. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. So, um, Antonio, do I, I know we're getting near to the end, but let me turn it over to you. No, I know. Uh... I think it's it's you know one of the roles of of leaders is actually do that is provide voices to to others that's what leadership is about is not to have the you know all the lights focus on themselves permanently is actually to give away to give those lights to someone else that's what leading is about now we we have done some work in Cork in some of our groups like Cork Healthy Cities where we do a lot of work to make Cork, the city more inclusive, and uh, my door is is to b open the door for organizations or people to to participate in our conversations. You no, know, and or when we are creating events, making sure that they are inclusive and everyone can join. So, so I think our role is basically to give that space and provide those those opportunities and be able to step back okay i think it's very important that we can step back okay and 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 let the you no know, uh, others to to shine and and speak and you know and when they do that we don't need to be there okay no we are fine they can just fly by themselves okay we're just you no know, somehow to facilitate don't they need my help know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, well said. Absolutely. Yeah. At, at the social innovation projects that we've done through our future work program, uh, we specifically set out to ensure that representation within those groups is at least half persons with disabilities, if not a greater representation, so that what is being developed and what is being implemented is actually authentically based on what people desire for the future that they want, right, and that they aspire to, not what we project that we believe that they need or want. Agree, agree. And, and that's why we were really excited about the work that you're doing, Shane. And, you know, we all have to be allies to each other and we, we have to really look about and look forward and see what kind of world we want for ourselves, for our children, for our friends, our loved ones. And we have to be part of this positive change. And I, I will tell you, I'm turning down projects where people are get, asking me to give me a lot of money, but I do not believe that their heart is in this. And uh, whenever we recently did this, um, this effort, this lobbying effort with the AB 1395, we were not paid to do that. But we did not want to be paid at that time. We wanted to make sure our community was okay. And we, um, and, we and then I think we should all take the time to thank Assemblyman um, Jordan Cunningham for listening. So uh, I, I'm optimistic, but I think um, people like me have to be more brave and really um, start calling out what is actually happening because I see it, everybody's seeing it, but nobody's, everybody's afraid. Every, I, I know this one very, very large nonprofit in the United States reached out to a business to business group and said, you know, I wish that when you're having conversations about IDD, intellectual disabilities, that you would expand it a little bit and, you know, please keep talking about autism. But, you know, we have people with Down syndrome, we have people with alcohol fetal syndrome, we have a lot of other, you know, spectrums on the IDD range. And when that happened, this this group started getting cut out of all conversations, uninviting to events. Uh, they were being punished for having the nerve to say, could we just expand the conversation? So uh, I think it's time for new leadership, and that's that's exactly what we're going to do. So that's why we were highlighting your work, Shane, and we really appreciate you. We want to make sure that we thank Barclays Access for supporting us, and Microlink, and my clear text, making sure everything that we do is accessible. Also, any disability groups that are putting out videos or anything, podcast, and you're not being accessible. You're becoming part of the problem. We all have to walk the walk. So Shane, thank you. Thank you for being on the program today. We want to provide links to the work that you're doing. I know you've been invited to speak in Geneva at the ILO Global Business Disability Network. I've been invited to speak as well. We're, we know other leaders we want to invite to come there. There is progress happening in the United States, but we need to stamp out some of this. Oh, it's all about me. It's all about me. 
uh, mentality yes. and we need to say this is all about the community and change in society. So thank you so much for your leadership, Shane. And Antonio, continue to love the way your brain works. And I'm glad Neil behaved and made his wife happy today on their holiday. And we look forward to continuing this conversation on Tuesday um, during the tweet chat. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank Shane. You. Thank you so much. Thank you.